My name is Barbara Mulvihill, and today I'm talking with Doug Mackey. Today's date is May 10th, 2018, and we are in the Campbell Room of the, of the Salina Public Library. Mr. Mackey, could you please state your full name? Doug Mackey. What branch of the service were Army. you? Army. Army, okay. And the highest rank you attained? Staff Sergeant. Staff Sergeant. And what war or conflict did you Vietnam. serve in? Vietnam. Um, could you tell us a little bit about how you entered, entered the service? Hmm. Well, I uh, got the wandering bug, wanted to go see the world. So I went to the recruiter and told him I wanted to get in, go to see the world. He said, well, you got the Army, Navy, Marines, and the Air Force. The Air Force won't take until next week. The Marines aren't getting anybody in right now. And uh, the Army's available, and you'll see a lot there. I said, okay, Army it is. <laughs> and what, what year was that? 1962. 1962. So you were in uh, quite ahead of the Vietnam conflict. Yeah, both, about three or four years. Yeah. Three or four years, yeah. Okay. Tell us a little bit about your service uh, before Vietnam and then how you got to Vietnam. Okay, well, <clears throat> see, when I got into service, they sent me to Fort Dix, New Jersey for basic training. And then they sent me to... Uh, Maryland to uh, Aberdeen Proving Grounds for secondary training. And from there, they shipped me over to Korea, where I spent a year uh, recovering vehicles and then into supply. And while in supply, I learned all the things that have to be. So when I left there, supply was my new MOS. Uh, I returned to the States and went to Fort Knox, Kentucky. Didn't like it there. I was there when they filmed the movie Goldfinger, but I wasn't able to participate because I was on duty. So then I was sent to uh, New Jersey, Fort Monmouth. No, excuse me, not Fort Monmouth. I went to New Jersey to a uh, company that was just starting up. I was there beginning to make up the supply room, but then they uh, they sent me up to uh, Fort Drum, New York. At that time, it was Camp Drum. And up there, I was taking care of the people who were working up there from the same unit. Uh, while there, I got orders to go to Italy, where I went for two years. And I served over there in, in supply and also in the motor pool, working with the locals and got to know a lot of them, got to speak a little language, got invited to their homes, got to do a lot of touring because I was also into sports. I was a referee for uh, basketball, and I was also a, an umpire for softball and baseball. I was on the uh, battalion team as a coach and a player, and I coached a little league team. And whenever we had to try to go somewhere else, I always drove the bus. And uh, so I got to see a lot of places in Italy. Unfortunately, I never got to Rome. But I did spend some time down in Venice, which is beautiful. Uh, I was stationed at Vicenza, but I went to Verona a lot. Had a great time for two years. and met my wife there. Uh, came back to the States, and they assigned me to uh, Fort Monmouth, New Jersey. And while I arrived at Fort Monmouth, the unit I was assigned to in headquarters had a shortage of material and supplies, meaning... They supplied the equipment whenever the units went out in the field to do field work. Uh, and they were in a fog photography units and stuff like that. So I was given the job of resupplying everything that we didn't have. Mm -hmm. So I was given a big, a big old truck and a couple of guys and sent down to Fort, I went down to Fort Dix where my old stomping grounds. I knew that they had their, what I needed. And I negotiated with the, uh, supply sergeants and the training NCOs and the uh, mess sergeants, and I got all the supplies we needed. And I was suddenly a hero in that unit. Mm -hmm. But then the commander and the uh, first sergeant both transferred out, and I got new commander and new sergeant, and they didn't know anything about what I had done. So one day I was caught sleeping in because I had my supply room all taken care of. And uh, since I was working nights, I slept in most days. 
for a couple hours. But anyway, I got caught. And they wrote me a letter of reprimand. And I was not very happy about that. So I tore up the letter of reprimand. And I attached it to what I call a 1049, which is a request for transfer. And I said, send me to Vietnam. And that's how I went to Vietnam. Wow. That's it. That's quite a story. <laughs> Uh, yeah. What what year was that? That in? was in sixty eight. Sixty eight. Okay. And uh, tell us about your arrival in Vietnam and then uh, what you uh, did there. This could be a little lengthy. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> we're ready. I arrived in Vietnam in, in uh, Class A uniform khakis at that time. It's the last time we wore them till we returned home. But I was assigned to a unit that was establishing a uh, supply point for people coming in uh, to Vietnam and going other places but needed what we call TA-50. It's uh, sleeping bags, uh, helmets, stuff like that. Uh, not weapons, but everything else but that a soldier need. And uh, we set this up in uh, one of the buildings and the, and the troops, <coughs> troops would come through, pick up their, all their supplies, go out the other side and get on a bus or truck and head out. And uh, there, from there, I was working at the uh, what's called, I guess, the unit supply store, where they have um, pencil papers, soap, things like that. That each unit comes to get them there. <clears throat> I can't remember what they call it, class six, but I always thought that was a liquor store. <laughs> and, and I worked the night shift there, and I had a crew of ten people that worked there. And what we did, we bring in these containers called Connex containers, and we'd empty them, put them in the storeroom, store everything. Well, as I say, I work nights, and things happen at night that don't normally happen during the day. And one night I discovered there was a little more action going on than I knew about. Apparently they were uh, bringing young ladies in from the town nearby and setting up cots in the Connex containers and inviting the troops over. Oh my and uh, I asked them how they got them in. And uh, one of the funny things was they would put them in a tank truck inside where the water and everything would normally be and then come through there and then open it up and they'd climb out. So. Let me interrupt just a second. I, I don't think I caught where you were at in Vietnam. That's uh, Long Bin. Long Bin. Yeah, that's where I was just at that time. Make sure I knew yeah. That. And uh, from there, I got so bored with it, I asked to be transferred again to something else. So I was given choices, and uh, one of the choices was a place called Vung Tau. And I don't like to talk about that because Vung Tau was an R&R &R center in country, and it was also an R&R &R center for Charlie. So and a lot of people wanted to go there, but I was stationed there. And I was stationed there with a what we call a Mike Boat Company. And a Mike Boat Company, is a, they go out and, and meet with the LSTs, the landing trips, and they get their supplies and bring them in to shore because the boats, the bigger boats can't get to shore. So these guys would go out there and, and pick up the supplies, or they might take supplies down the Delta or somewhere else along the rivers. And my job was to keep them in happy. So one of the things that they really liked is to have conveniences on the boats. And one of the conveniences they wanted was a toilet because these were boats that were small and they didn't have anything on them. So the boys wanted toilets. And I went over to the reclaim area and found toilets for all the boats and then wood to build a hooch and a cover so that they could set them up there and be in privacy on the water. Mm -hmm. That was one of my accomplishments there. While there, I also worked in the uh, the entertainment club uh, as an MA and uh, kept quiet in the clubs when people got a little drunk and uh, got a little over zealous, I'd say. What's an MA? Uh, Master, of Master of Arms. Yeah. Uh, more like a bouncer. Okay. Anyway, from there, uh, I got an inspection of my supply room, which came up perfect so that the headquarters company decided. They wanted me to move up there and take over the headquarters supply. And uh, so I did. But then the unit that they moved into moved back to Long Bend. 
So I left Lung Tao and went back to Long Bin. Well, while I was at Long Bin, of course, the people who were in Lung Tao had never come under any kind of attack, had never experienced any kind of the war because nothing went on down there. It was on the on the beach. Uh, you know, it was a laid back area. So <clears throat> they hadn't experienced the trauma of war. When we got back to Long Bend, we were uh, book. Uh, I want to say book. We were placed in a unit uh, area that was next to the uh, uh, ammo dump. And at night, and during the day, but at night mainly, uh, Charlie would lob mortars into the ammo dump because they knew where they were and was trying to make the, you know, ruin them. Anyway, <clears throat> the first night it happened, the siren went off and everybody got nervous. And outside of our barracks, we had a Quonset hut, which was used with sandbags around it as a shelter, kind of like a tornado shelter. And uh, the first night it happened, why, everybody went out there and they're in there and they're nervous, they're shaking, they're scared, they don't know what to do. And since I had been there before and knew what was going on, of course, I, I walked out of my hooch and I had a bottle of whiskey in one hand. I was wearing light blue shorty pajamas and a helmet. And I stood up in front of them and I said, hey, guys, don't get nervous. Let's get outside. And I put them all outside, lined them up along the, the shelter. And I stood there while he, uh, they were dropping the, whatever they were dropping that day. And I told jokes for better part of an hour, anything I could think of, and entertained them and kept them quiet, kept them calm, relaxed them a little bit. So when siren all cleared, they all went back to bed. Everything was fine. Next day, I got called into the uh, CEO's office, and he said, uh, I don't know whether I should court-martial you or pin a medal on you for what you did last night, but let's not do it again. And so I said, okay, well, fine. And then... It got close to my time to leave, and I short just before I was ready to leave, I decided I wanted to go back to Vung Tau to visit some old folks that are still down there. So I caught a ride on a medevac chopper and uh, got down to Vung Tau. I had one day left after I got back, and on the way back in the medevac chopper, we got a signal of a, an accident on the highway. So the chopper lowered down to about, oh, 100 feet over the accident, and we started taking ground fire. It was an ambush. Mm -hmm. And we got out of there, fortunately, and no damage. But that's about as close as I came to getting injured. Never lost anything else. But it was, to me, different kind of war than most people have experienced with their combat and what have you. Uh, I saw troops come back from combat where they were staring at and didn't know where they were. And I went by the hospitals over there and saw the wounded and it was, uh, I was glad I was where I was at because I wasn't in danger in my mind, even though the danger was all around us. I just never experienced it. Could you tell us what a typical day was like for you as a supply sergeant? Well, a typical day would be, uh, if it was laundry day, I'd gather all the dirty laundry, we pile it into the back of a truck and we take it down to a civilian laundry. And right next to the civilian laundry was a, uh, I guess you call it a bar. And uh, all the guys that knew I was going down there on the laundry run always wanted to go with me. Because while we put the laundry in to get it washed, they'd go across the street to the bar. And there was a couple of young ladies there to entertain them. And they kind of always wanted to go along for that purpose. And, We'd be there for probably an hour, an hour and a half, and then load up our clean supplies and take them back. Other days, it was a matter of, uh, oh, one day I had to go to, from Bung Tower to Saigon, which is the capital, but I had to take the road, and I couldn't fly up there. I didn't have a helicopter at the time, but so I jumped in a, what they call it, a deuce and a half truck. I had a helmet, a flak jacket, a 45 and an M16, and I was alone. And I drove from Vung Tau to Saigon, which is about the distance of here to Topeka, through enemy territory. 
because the roads were not secure. And in fact, while I was doing this, one place I entered, entered was uh, the Australians were clearing the area because there had been an, uh, some action there the night before. And they just waved me through, and I went, and I didn't stop for anything. Then another time, which flies, uh, I got on the mic boat, and we went to Saigon. And, and as we're going up the river, we took fire from one of the inlets. And the, I was in a head boat, and the guy in the tailboat was telling me that he was getting to fired on. What was I? What were they supposed to do? And I said, just return fire. They had machine guns, and they returned fire. We just kept going. We got up to Saigon, and one of the things we needed was a generator mounted on a trailer. Well, I had a legal request for one, and I took it in, and the guy said, we don't have any more. We're out. And there's only one left, and it's on that convoy of Korean troops going out shortly. And I said, well, if you'll sign this request, I'll take care of it. He signed a request. I got my men together. We went in there with the truck. We hooked it from where they had it, hooked it on ours, and took off. <laughs> took it on, put it down in the boat, and away we went. And of course, I imagine there was some slack afterwards, but I never caught any. Then another day might be uh, they were troops down in the Delta that needed supplies. And so the Mike boats would be down there supplying, but they needed ammunition and weapons. So I was with this major, and we got a helicopter. We went to Saigon. We loaded up with ammunition and, and machine guns, and we flew down to the Delta to meet the Mike boats. And when we got there, we just hovered over the boats, handed the stuff out the windows, and took off. Kind of uh, shaky at the time, but we were very fortunate. We didn't encounter any trouble. Another day might be uh, simply going to the reclaim yard, looking for things that uh, people were requesting, like the toilets. Uh, another time might be, uh, for me, I was taking a course in accounting, so I would do some accounting work while I was uh, in my idle time. So, But uh, I was in an area which was very much secure, I would say. I was close to, to the air base. I, was, uh, I met a lot of guys from there. I uh, met a lot of guys from the uh, other units because we had a restaurant right there on base that uh, served... Uh, uh, a Thai cuisine, I guess you'd say. So we'd uh, go there because it was very cheap. You could have a whole meal for a dollar. Then at night, why, sometimes we'd hit the clubs or uh, they had little places set up every unit, it seemed like. They had a little bar set up in the unit. Now, a bottle of Chevitz Regal at that time there cost a dollar and 80 cents. Now, today you can't buy it for $35. But the drinks were 10 cents a piece. So it wasn't hard for you to get inebriated in a hurry if you wanted to. And believe me, there were a lot of guys that, that, that it wasn't the combat that scared them. It was the threat of being attacked or the threat that something might happen. Because they kept hearing stories from people who'd been in combat of what it was like. And so they unwind at night and... Many times they got out of hand, but not myself. I stayed pretty good that way. For the longest time, anyway. <laughs> uh, but that was the typical way a day went. Okay. So, uh, did you, or what types of interactions did you have uh, with both the South Vietnamese uh, troops and the South Vietnamese people? Well, as a as a uh, uh, MA at the club, there was a lot of uh, waitresses and stuff like that, and I met them, and I know a couple of them I talked with said that their husbands were Charlie, VC, uh, in uh, going to uh, town for maybe minor supplies or something. I got to meet the local people. I also got to meet people in the uh, restaurants downtown, uh, on the beach. Everybody I talked to was uh, extremely nice and thankful that we were there. Uh, there was no animosity that I could see. I'm sure there was some somewhere, but where we were and where I was stationed and the people I interacted with, they didn't show it to me. 
Of course, that could be my personality. <laughs> <laughs> could you describe your worst day? In my Vietnam? worst day? Yeah. Uh, let's see. I think it was uh, the day I had to leave. Because uh, I wanted to stay and they wouldn't let me extend. Uh, I was not looking forward to come back to the States. I wanted to stay overseas. I wanted to stay there. I didn't think I had accomplished enough and I wanted to do more, but as a result, I i guess it was my own fault, but uh, when I came through an inspection and they kept sending me requests to be inspected again and inspected again, and I said, I don't have the bodies to do the work you want me to do. Either I do the work myself and it takes longer, uh, but apparently the uh, inspector didn't like it. Went to the commander and the commander called me in. He says, I understand it. You don't think we're doing the right thing? I said, well, the way it's working, I don't appreciate that. Anyway, uh, the next thing I know, I was relieved of the uh, supply room, and all I did was monitor the uh, amount of people going in to meals. Hmm. And that was for the last week I was there. Hmm. Wasn't any fun. Hmm. Uh, as far as uh, scariness and uh, worry, I think that... Uh, mm, I guess when I was in the reclaiming yard one day, uh, a mortar dropped right in front of my truck, and uh, they were dropping him on the ammo dump, but they were coming up short. And so I just put the truck in neutral, turned the mission, turned the ignition off, and jumped out of the truck and got in the uh, in the ditch. And that was probably the closest because I saw two more mortars drop within a oh, hundred yards of me, mm -hmm. but that was the closest I came to being involved and it was scary well on the other hand could you describe your the best day you had in vietnam yeah that was the day i got promoted <laughs> i got promoted to staff sergeant and uh, at the club where i was working they uh, threw a big party but it wasn't only for me there was a seal team that was bunked uh, barracks close by. And whenever they had a uh, uh, motion, one of the things they did was wake whoever it was, wake him up, and then uh, they would make him drink till he was totally out of it. And uh, they would put the stripes on by hitting him with a fist, <laughs> knock him on his arm. And that everybody got the hit. And they didn't play fun. They didn't hold back. So when I got promoted, they were in there, and they said, well, we do it. Let's do it to you. I had a very sore arm when I got done with that. But I had fun, and we, I really enjoyed it. It was great to be, be promoted. Yeah. Um, let's see. After you were discharged, what, what did you do? From the service? Uh, or, I'm sorry. After you left Vietnam. After I left Vietnam. Let's see, I was stationed, let's see, where was I, where did I go after Vietnam? That would have been, oh, I went to Germany. No, I went to South Carolina, and I was there for a year, and I worked with civilians down there, uh, doing supply work there, and then uh, I re-enlisted. I was going to get out of the service, and I re-enlisted, and when I re-enlisted, I re-enlisted to go to Germany. And I went back to Germany, and the wife that I met in Italy was in Holland. And when I went to Germany, I contacted her again. She came to Germany. We got together. Within a year, we were married. So then from there, I came back to the States and was here at Fort, uh, Fort Riley, Kansas until my discharge. And let's see, what year did you leave Vietnam, and what year were you discharged? Well, it would have been 69. Yeah, I came back to the states and went to Fort, uh, to uh, Fort Jackson, South Carolina, and then went to Germany in '70, and left the service in '74. So you were twelve over years. Twelve years. Okay. Um, a lot, a lot of servicemen uh, experience. Uh, 
uh, negative feedback from a lot of people when they came home from Vietnam. Did you experience any? I didn't. That? Uh, I, of course, uh, I came to a military area, so we yeah. didn't experience as much. But I, uh, I saw a lot of news reports about it. But I personally never got spit on or looked at wrong or talked about because, like I said, I was in the military area, and when you're in the military area, you, you don't get the same. Mm -hmm. So no, I didn't experience that. Um. Did you have any after effects from being in Vietnam? You know, I, I didn't ever, ever have any other normal dreams, that, but they weren't nightmares or anything like that. I didn't suffer post-traumatic stress or, uh, not that I can think blame for that, but I, I don't have any illnesses or mm -hmm. anything that uh, I'm being treated for for it. Okay. Um, what was there anything else that you were wanted to share about your Vietnam experience? Well, the only thing I'd like to share is that if the people who encounter people that were in Vietnam, and not everybody was on the front line and in the jungle, but those that were, you got to give them credit because they took to, they had a heck of a life, and I don't envy them the fact that I didn't get there. Uh, what I saw was enough for me, and I saw a lot of troops that never saw combat come back, and I won't say they lied, but they stressed the truth about what they did over there. Mm -hmm. Now, if you were in combat, and you saw people getting killed, and you saw people being maimed, I'm sure you didn't want to talk about it, mm -hmm. and a lot of them are still that way, and I don't blame them. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't have. How would you say your your Vietnam experience uh, changed your life, and how uh, how how has it either benefited or detracted from your life since you left the service? Well, I guess you'd say I have a, a lower stress level now because I don't. I don't fear dying. I don't. Uh, I don't think there's anything that's going to happen to me that isn't ordained some way. Uh, I do things uh, with a purpose. That tomorrow's tomorrow, today's today. If I can't get it done today, I may not get it done tomorrow because I may not be here. But I'm not worried about it. And for being the age I am, I think that. Uh, I'm pretty lucky because there's a lot of my folks of my age are passing away every day. And and some of them from Vietnam, uh, the one thing I do have is I have a connection with a unit that I was in Italy with, and I've got a roster of people on there that I served with, and, and some of them aren't around anymore. Some of them went to Vietnam and, and lost out. So... Uh, did you have something there that you wanted to Well, I was, I was just seeing. I wrote down a few things just in case you didn't ask me about them. Okay. Uh, I just, uh, yeah. well, there's one little anecdote I guess I didn't talk about. When I arrived in Vietnam the first day, uh, once we got settled into where we were going, uh, I was an NCO, so I was put in charge of a, a uh, group of men, and they were pouring cement on uh, sidewalks. And I was instructed that they were not to take their shirts off, and they were to keep their sleeves rolled down, and to wear a hat at all times. And at, at first I thought that's weird because it was scorching hot. Uh, temperatures, if they weren't 100, they were close to it. And so I did the detail, and I I rolled up my sleeves. Well, at the end of the day, I knew why they had everybody covered up. I was scorched on my arms, burnt. Uh, and they said, yeah, the sun is different. You're close to the equator. You'll burn quicker. Don't go out in the sun without some sunscreen. Of course, in those days, there wasn't much sunscreen. 
But the one thing they did do is they didn't take a jacket off. Now, I'm sure you've all seen movies where they're on the and and they're on these outposts and they're topless, you know, mm -hmm. walking around. I can assure you, they didn't go that way all the time. They got tanned and their bodies are used to it before they started doing that on a daily basis because the sun was hot and then when it wasn't hot, it was raining. The monsoon season, when it came, it you could almost set your clock by it. Three o'clock in the afternoon, you're going to get rain. Five o'clock in the afternoon, nothing's going to be dry. It's that quick. Uh, a lot of times when they had softball games and stuff planned, uh, they were worried the fields were going to be wet. Well, it rained at 3, 4.30, the fields were ready to play on. Mm -hmm. It was just that way. And no matter where you went, you were going to get, uh, you had to acclimate to that weather. And a lot of guys took a while to do it. Fortunately, I always acclimated to weather, and I got used to it, and I got a nice tan out of it. But uh, uh, there were some guys that, that didn't heed the warning. And we're overcome by it. I'm sure that there's some cases of it where uh, people got sunstroke and what have you mm. because it was that bad. And it reminded me that today when I'm out there in the heat and I start to feel it and I start to sweat too much or I start to lose a little, uh, I get a little lighted, I know right then and there to stop, quit, get some water, whatever, cool down. Because if I don't, something's going to pop. And especially at my age, I'm too young to be dying yet. Um, you mentioned that you were in contact with some of the buddies you had served with in Italy. Did you keep in contact with the uh, people you work with in Vietnam? There was only one man that I ever saw when I came back to the States that was stationed with me in Vietnam. Oh. And he came to Junction City and... Uh, Stayed there, that's where he lived. I, I ran into him maybe four or five times. And the only reason I remember him is because he and another guy had a, uh, uh, their room, they room with me over the supply room. And that's why I knew they sit up there all day smoking pot and not working, so it didn't matter. But, uh, yeah, I ran into one of them. That's the only one, though, from Vietnam. So I, I don't remember the names of the people. Uh, and if I saw him today, I probably wouldn't recognize him. Okay. Now, on the other side, Italy, it was different. Now, all those people in Italy, I, I remember a lot of them because I had yeah. a lot of fun in Italy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that so, sounds like that was probably the the uh, yeah, place you highlight. enjoyed the Those most. two years were wonderful. <laughs> in Vietnam, actually, it's where I learned how to swing a golf club. But, yeah, there were... <laughs> Every unit in in the in the back area, not the forward area, but the back area, they would have a, a set up built fields for for playing uh, softball, baseball, because they'd get the things they needed from the. You could get anything you wanted if you asked for it. I mean, it was that simple. You were there in Vietnam; they were going to try to take care of you in the back. Yeah, but in forward areas, I don't know what they did there, but. We had baseball fields and we had soccer fields and uh, they had a gym with the basketball. You know, you had weight rooms and, you know, there was all those amenities that you could possibly want. And if there weren't, you just asked for them. I mean, like if we wanted to have a company party, we requisitioned 10 cases of beer. We did it, you know. <laughs> and, and, and you, I wanted to take pictures of it, but in, in the supply area where I was, the reclaim area, There'd be pallets full of beer out in the sun, boiling, uh, you know. And I, I thought surely they'd turn bad, but yeah, you know, they it, they would just take it and cool it any way they could possibly think of. I know some guys who used to take a, a waterproof bag, we call them, for putting your stuff in during the rainy months, and they put the beer in there and then take a fire extinguisher and. <laughs> And it would cool the beer down. You know? <laughs> yeah, that's uh, imaginative. <laughs> and, and, and every everybody wanted little refrigerators or big refrigerators in their in their barracks. So it's one of the biggest things I had to scrounge up was uh, refrigerators. I know in our in our units, but uh, I don't know if any <laughs> anything you did that you wanted you could get, and it was very low cost or no cost at all. That was a 
and and being in supply, you if you were any good, you knew where all the stuff was and how to get it. <laughs> because you see, if you lose something or if something gets broken, you just fill out a form and send it in, take it, throw it away, and they bring you a new one. <laughs> it's that simple. Well, I imagine you know since you were behind the lines that there was a lot of downtime that needed to be filled. Is that well, right? Well, see, there's where the the downtime you, you would think there would be, but in the rear area, that's where all your vehicles got repaired. That's where all your equipment got repaired, where your supplies were ordered, where your supplies were stored. There was a lot of work to do, and uh, and if you didn't have work, they'd make work. Mm -hmm. Because you had, like you said, you had to keep them busy. Mm -hmm. You had to keep people busy because if you didn't, they'd find trouble. Mm -hmm. It's just that simple. If you idle hands, mm -hmm. they will find trouble. And uh, there wasn't any uh, a lot of malingering that I saw because everybody had something to do, and they knew they were there for a purpose, and they were knew that they were supporting the guys up front. And so they did their job so that the guys up there could do theirs. That's basically what I saw. Well, sounds like you you did a great job as a supply sergeant. Uh, <laughs> I would like I would like to have you as my supply sergeant. Well I had an incident that happened in Germany that was just as bad. <laughs> uh, I was over there and, and I wanted to come back I was coming back to the States by uh, and uh, when I went to sign off and get my ticket to fly back, <clears throat> I went into the CEO and he said, no, I'm not letting you go. He says, I'm putting you on a 30-day administrative leave. Uh, I'm in headquarters company now. I've been moved over to headquarters. And the, the uh, property books didn't jive. I mean, the weapons and the vehicles and things that we were supposed to have, we didn't have. We had the vehicles, but they weren't ours. Uh -huh. They belonged to another unit. Another unit had our stuff. Uh -huh. So for 30 days on this one base I was on, the rock, all I did, and my wife helped me, we went from unit to unit, and we looked for their, uh -huh. we looked through all their armory, we looked through all their motor, their motor pools, and we found the vehicles, trailers, trucks, machine guns, weapons of all type, and we did uh, what they call a hand receipt. I'd write them a hand receipt for that and take it back. And if I had one of theirs, they'd write oh, me a hand receipt. Oh, boy. And for 30 days, that's all I did. <laughs> that was a big job. Yeah, I uh, probably recovered several million dollars worth of equipment. Wow. You know? uh, but that, that was because when training over in Europe, you'd go to a training site and you didn't have what you needed. you get it from the unit next door. But you forget to take it back. Yeah. And yours was in repair. And when it came back from repair, it went to the other unit. And so mm -hmm. it was never, the, the supply people that were taking care of it didn't keep a very good track. Mm -hmm. And as a result, that's what ended up. So mm -hmm. That was what I did over there before I left the service. <laughs> so. Well, I want to thank you for your service. Well, thank you. We really appreciate uh, you doing this for our country. And thank you for contributing your story. Well, I know it won't do really any good. Really appreciate but I, that. I hope somebody enjoys it. Oh, I'm sure <laughs> they will. And, uh, and learn from it, too. You I know, hope. learn exactly what happened. And, yeah, I hope. Yeah, I think well, so. Good. Well, thank you.